Ladies and gentlemen, welcome back to another episode of Couple of Nukes. As always, I'm your host, Mr. Whiskey. And a lot of us nowadays feel like we have to do everything by ourselves. We take on so many roles, and especially when it comes to something like addiction or something that people, we end up feeling ashamed about or guilty, or we definitely don't want to reach out to people for help because we're embarrassed. But as the famous song goes, we all need someone to lean on. We all need an ally. And today I have brought you an ally in your recovery, Jen Ally. And she is here to talk about her personal struggles, the help she got, and the ideas around help, the reality of it, and what y'all can do as loved ones or as addicted ones to get recovered. So Ms. Jen, would you please introduce yourself for us? Hi, yes. Thank you for having me. And yes, I am a Gen Ally. I'm your ally in recovery. I am from the United States over in Pennsylvania, born and raised in New Jersey, but I am now in Pennsylvania. And yes, I have a story, quite a story of alcohol addiction and recovery. We'll just go back a little bit into my just brief overview of my childhood. It's kind of what led up to it. Because I kind of took like a little different, I think, path than it seems most people do. So growing up, there was no alcohol in the house. I was, you know, two parents, a brother, went to church, youth group, you know, all that. Never, you know, really was much of any, I didn't really get in a lot of trouble. I was more fearful of being in trouble. <laughs> um, always had like this, even like from birth, like I had this over like reactive nervous system and I was always had this overwhelming anxiety, but you know, all through my school years, there was some bullying that went on and I just never really uh, learned how to deal with that. So unless I was around like my family or like church, I just didn't feel like I belonged, Mm. Um, you know, and that was tough, but needless to say, I went on, I, we got married. I met somebody who lived in Pennsylvania. I got married at 24, moved up to Pennsylvania. Now at this point, my only like interaction with alcohol was a little bit when I turned 21, I was drinking if we were to go out, you know, like yes. socially. Yeah. But now looking back at that, it was a little red flag because like Mm. if I was to go out with somebody I didn't just have like one or two like all of a sudden I loved the feeling like all of a sudden I found this this thing finally that like made me like not anxious while I was in you know social settings it made people like me I was funny and it just numbed me you know and so like I fell in love with that feeling so the few you know times that we would go out whether it was with my brother or my then boyfriend like they would have to watch me because I would just keep going and Mm. what would have happened to me you know so looking back that was probably a huge red flag that I just wasn't drinking like uh, normal and the reason why I was doing it. So, so anyway, fast forward, I get married uh, again, no, no drinking. Like I was able to just not drink happy, you know, so married a few years later and I got married in 98, 2001, I'm 28. I have my daughter. And so life's going along, getting a little little stressful, you know, Mm, uh, yeah. One child, my bulk of my family's in New Jersey, you know, love her to death. She's a great kid, but you know, she was a little colicky. So that's going on, you know, as the years go on where we built a new house, pressures of that pressures. I'm working at a hospital, a major hospital up here. You know, the job is I'm getting promotions. I'm doing well, but it's bringing on more anxiety and more uh, stress. Yeah. My parents are going through a divorce, you know, I'm back in Jersey. I'm worried about my mom. Like I'm just taking on a lot and, you know, there's starting to become some marital issues, which everybody has, you know, relationship issues, maybe a little more severe than others. I don't know. But what happened was we started going out to these wine fests. They were kind of popular Mm. back then. You know, they were just becoming, yeah. So we start going to socially with neighbors and all of a sudden, like, I'm not even liking the taste of it, but I'm getting that feeling again. Okay. Oh, wow. You know, so, but this was a slow progression. You know, this probably, 
went from like my early thirties, you know, and now I was a blackout drinker. So all of the, sometimes it's hard for me to like pinpoint exact dates and, you know, it went progressed over like probably the next six years, like slowly, but it progressed. So it went from, you know, it went from the, the wine and then eventually it went to harder stuff. So I was coming home mm. from work going across the street to my neighbors and she was like, we were having like gin and like scotch, yeah. stuff like that. So I'm getting introduced to that. And now I'm like, Oh, this is good. Now I can go home deal with whatever I got to deal with, you know, mm. and uh, it'll be fine. So again, so as the years go on, it's getting worse. I'm starting to like hide it. You know, I'm trying to come, I, I'm coming home from work. I'm like going up to the closet and drinking before dinner. So then, oh wow, then, yeah, it doesn't seem like I've had that many, you know, and I mean, this is how it progressed, you know, people, nobody really caught on right away because I was functioning, you know, like I was going to work, I was doing the things I was raising my daughter, you know, so it was very functional from what I thought for, you know, years where nobody was really catching on to how progressive it was getting until, you know, there was like no way you could deny it anymore. But like some of the things I was doing, like to hide it, like I said, was hiding the bottles. If we were going to go out, yeah. have a few quick before we went out. So people, when I went out and had two glasses, people are thinking that's all I had, you know, and that I'm getting, you know, buying the stuff when nobody's home and getting it into the house, collecting the bottles somewhere and then taking them somewhere else to get rid of them, you know, so that they're not in my recycling. So my husband and, you know, isn't aware of this. So finally, you know, in, in 2000, end of 2015, 16, it's like, I can't deny it anymore. Like in my husband's starting to notice, I work from home a couple of days a week. It was getting like, there was one incident where I was on a meeting at work and I fell off of the meeting because I was drinking and they called my husband to come home and check on me. So, so it's getting like, okay, I can't hide it anymore. So there was a push, of course, for me to get help. And, you know, of course, I'm denying it as we do. And so I start, I'm like, fine, because everybody just wouldn't get off my case, I'll go to AA. So I started that in the beginning of 2016. But I'm doing this just to like make everybody happy. So yeah. I'm, before I go in the meeting, I'm drinking when I leave, I'm, I'm getting therapy but I'm getting therapy from someone who didn't deal with addiction. So mm. I'm getting a lot of like help there. Cause yeah. they, they're just like, well, just put it down. What's wrong with you? <laughs> you know? So, you know, or like he said, one, tell me when it comes out of the store and pours itself down your throat. I'm like, okay. So <laughs> well, I guess what happened one night I was in therapy and um, I mentioned something about not wanting to live. So they sent somebody to the house, did an intervention. And then that night, between my husband and my mom in New Jersey, they got me into a rehab and it was in Florida. And so the next day, you know, I'm freaking out. I'm scared. I don't want to go, but I'm going. <laughs> so yeah. they give me $20 because I have to stop in Atlanta and they don't want me taken off or, you know, so of course I go to the bar and have my last drinks. I go into this rehab, my first one and uh five and the thing with the rehabs that i want to say too up front was okay if there's somewhere to go um and it gives your family kind of some peace of mind you know for 30 days or whatever they know you're safe they know you're somewhere right uh, but unless the person's ready you know it's very rare it's going to work because it takes a lot of work you know to get yeah, so sure. it's not easy especially when you've escalated to the point that I did where I literally had a drink 24 seven at this point to just not shake or to function, you know, my body, it wasn't even like I was drinking it anymore because I liked it. So I go in, you know, I do my best, but you know, my heart's really not in it. I come out and I'm drinking on the plane back home already. So that's 2016. So this happens the that was like in May. So by August, I'm leaving the marriage. I've already met somebody else. I'm drinking, they're drinking, I'm with them. And thank goodness, because like the way I was drinking, I probably would have like died had I just went somewhere on my own, like to an apartment. Mm. So I'm in another rehab by the end of that year. Again, 
you know, it's, it, I'm not, rehab's great if you're ready, you know, and it's structured. That's the other thing. But I, again, I'm not ready. So I'm just like, just stop everybody from like, you know, like yelling at me and like, you know, it, it just the pressure. So I'm fine. I'll go again. Again, it didn't work for me again, just because I wasn't ready. So this goes on for a couple more years. And so we're going from three years. Okay. I'm going in and out of rehabs, in and out of hospitals. Now in this time frame, now it's starting to affect my health. Right. Okay. I'm getting pancreatitis, which was the most God awful pain in my life. So do you think that would make me stop? No. Cause what we do is the pain starts to get better. Okay. For a few months I did, you know, but then the pain starts to get better. And you're like that trick in your mind is like, okay, I can do this again. I can handle yeah. it. <laughs> so, so you go and do it again. It makes no sense, but we do. So then you're back off to the races and usually worse off than the last time. So, so we're into 2019 now. I'm four rehabs in, and now it's February of 2019, and I'm heading down to see my family in New Jersey. Nobody really knows I'm like drinking again. So I had a few. I get in the car. I start going down. Well, at this point, like my relationship with my daughter strained. She's a, like a young teenager. She knows enough to be like, this is toxic. I love you. You've been the greatest mom for like 13 years, but like, I need to like yeah. distance myself right now, which broke my heart, but it may, you know, made perfect sense. She was mature enough. So anyway, I see she's out looking at, you know, colleges and because I'm drinking, you know, of course that's my go-to with somebody else, not me. She's looking at these. So I stop at a liquor store. I get some more liquor. I'm planning to drink it when I get to my mom's. Well, I didn't wait. And next thing I know really is there's like lights behind me, the cops, but then I don't remember anything at all until I'm back. I'm in the back of the cop car, which is like 30 some, 40 some minutes later, because I took them on like this 32 mile chase on the mm. parkway, in New Jersey. Okay. I'm not stopping. Now it started out as I was driving too slow. So somebody called it in thinking I was having a medical emergency. And then once the cops got up alongside of me, they could see me drinking and knew what it was, but I don't remember any of it. And so I'm on and off the freeway, the parkway, I'm going through the middle of circles. You know, I ran over like a stop sign. I just, I, they would get me stopped and I would like maneuver my way back out so they finally get me stopped. And I guess from what I'm told and what I read, and it is true, but I didn't realize this, that I, then I wouldn't get out of the car. I locked the doors. So they had to smash the window open. I still don't even know because the next day when I saw my car, I'm like, why don't I have a window? And my dad's like, well, they had to like smash it open. You wouldn't get out. Like, I didn't even remember that. That's how blacked out I was. How scary. I mean, you mm -hmm. talk about like, god and like the grace and with me that night that nobody including myself or any in this right thing. so so now like you know i go to the jail that night and then they let me go um but a few days later they call me back in and i have to stay at like 24 hours in jail for my first time ever in jail so i'm there 24 hours they let me out and then i go back up to pennsylvania um you know, with my now husband. And now I'm really nervous. You know, I'm really scared because now I'm looking at possible one to five years prison, state prison. I get a good lawyer, um, pay him, but I'm still drinking. You know, that wasn't even enough again, because my, partly because my body is so physically addicted to it, because there was a point in these, you know, like these three years from 2016 to 2019, one of my hospital stays was because I tried to stop myself because I didn't want anybody to know. Right. And I started seeing people and hearing things and going into like seizures. So you can die. I didn't realize from alcohol withdrawal. So I was in the hospital at that point for two weeks because they didn't even know if I was coming out of it. So, so anyway, I get back home, I'm drinking and then I'm in the hospital two more times. And that was February. What happened with the cops? This is April at the end of April. And then finally somebody comes to talk to me a uh, certified peer specialist. 
because all my times in the hospital, hardly any of those times was I treated very, there was a few really good doctors and nurses who understood, but most of the time I was just treated like, you know, dirt really, you know, because it's just like, oh, here she is, you know, she's drunk, she's alcoholic, put her over there, like, like very mean, you know, to the point, like some of them were just like laughing at me and it, it was just horrible. And that's why the one time I tried to do it by myself, I was afraid to go back. Right. To the so she comes and talks to me. And this is the first time someone's actually sitting down talking to me that like, I'm like, wow, like she gets it. Like, she's not judging me. She's been there and now she's recovered and she's sitting on this bed helping me. And so I finally, for the first time, had like some kind of hope and that I could get better, you know, and, you know, maybe myself go on to help others in that same hospital stay because of my background, you know, with church and God, like I just, I just gave it up to him. I said, listen, I can't do this anymore by myself. And I just, I mean, need you please, you know, to just one more time, you know, let me live. And I promise like, I'm going to go back, you know, and pull other people out, you know, and, but I need your help. So between that and this peer specialist, I went to my final rehab. It was probably the worst one I went to, but I was ready. Right. And, you know, so I did the work while I was there. I was like, just like determined. I'm like, give me stuff to do. I need stuff to do. I, I, I got to get out of here and get on with my life. So I did that. And then when I came out, I had like an intensive outpatient set up immediately. And I did, completed all 48 of those sessions, which was great. It was like three nights a week, somewhere to go with other like-minded people and, okay. same, you know, like situations. And we were able to yeah. like work things out. Like if I would come there upset about something, like we were able to work it out there, you know, and I didn't have to go, you know, drink over it. Right. How to like finally process my fears and anxieties and, you know, all that stuff that I just I couldn't figure out how to do without drinking. And then- I, when that ended in the end of 2019, then I decided to go back to school. And so I got a job. I went back to school and eventually got my associates. And then I got my bachelor's in um, addiction and recovery counseling. So with that being said, that just happened in December of this past year that I got my final, you know, certificate or my diploma. And then I launched right into trying to start my own business, you know, helping others. Because I believe that the most important thing about recovery is you finding somebody who appear, who relates. That's why I believe, like, yeah. you know, AA is great. It helps millions of people. It didn't really work that great for me, but that's okay. Because now in 2024, we have like, a lot of different ways to get sober. It's not oh, just yeah. AA anymore, you know? So still a great thing. It's saved millions, but I really believe like having that person, that pure person. So I also got my certified recovery specialist certificate and you can only get that if you've been in recovery. And so I believe like that is the way to help people because you really can't understand it even though you might say you do, or you might be so empathetic about it, but really, unless you've been through it, you, it's, it's hard, it's hard to like, understand why this person keeps doing this, you know, and it can be yeah. frustrating and, and rehabs, you know, they're good. They work, especially it gives you some place, you know, to like, re, like just chill for like 30 days, you right. know, to get yourself like back. You know, like, cause it takes a while once you go through detox and then you can, you have somewhere and you're safe, you, you know, and there's people there to help you. But again, it's, it's, you have to do the work, you know, like people can sit there and give you help and advice and, but you have to do it. It's possible. Cause I mean, if anybody, if I can get sober, you know, like anybody can, but it's not easy, you know, so you really have to want it because, it just doesn't, you know, just snap your fingers or like, I think a lot of family believe that it's like, okay, you know, like we, we got them in the rehab. This is it. They're going to come back. They're going to be fixed. Right. 
you know, and it doesn't always work that way. <laughs> Yeah. You know, and then they blame, you know, like the person or the rehab and they're like, well, what happened? You know, we put you there for 30 days or 90 days and they just think it's like a miracle. And, you know, if that person isn't dedicated to getting better and continuing some sort of outpatient, whether it's just regular therapy or somebody like me who's been through it to go alongside of them it's not always that way. And I think that a lot of families have that high expectation of rehabs. So then when they come out, you know, they're kind of disappointed if it doesn't, you know, work or they're just, it's it's just like any other kind of disease, you know, like if you're not, if you're going to, you know, get cancer, if you have cancer and you get um, in remission, but if you don't keep like doing the medicine or what they tell you, you have to do, yeah. you know, it's going to come back or diabetes. If you don't take the insulin, you know, and do the work to like live healthy and eat healthy, like it's not, it's going to keep coming back, you know? And yeah, it, it, it's hard because for so many years, that's where you do it's a habit and it's a feeling and that's where you went. And with alcohol, it's everywhere. You know, that's the one thing, like, unless I just stayed locked up in my room, like, and didn't right. watch TV, yeah. You know, and only ate at McDonald's, but they'll probably have liquor there soon too. But, you know, it, it's on every corner. It's on every commercial. It's in every movie. It's in the grocery stores. You know, yeah. it, it's yeah. made to look like it's this great fun thing. And unfortunately, a lot of the commercials and stuff don't show the next day or the destruction, you know, that it does to families. And, and I understand not everybody goes down that route, you know, right. still. I mean, it, I mean, when you think about it, it is poison, you know, and you are pouring it down into your body, into your body. Um, but like, once you get to that point where your visit, your body is like just relying on it, you're, you're not going to be able to help them until they get into a hospital and get detoxed, you know, and then their mind clear that they can actually start, you know, the therapy and the work needed to process and not, you know, return to that old habit. And it's hard it's hard because it's easy, you know, like who wants to sit with their feelings and like have to talk to somebody about it and like, right. go take a walk instead, you know, but you know, the reality is, you know, I was me myself, my body wasn't going to take much more. Like they were like, if we see you here again, like you're going to be in the morgue, you know, like just the way it affected my body. And it does that with women. But the thing to, what I want to talk about too, is the stigma, like, especially with women, it seems like it's more like, Hey, you know, like with the guy stop at the bar, have a few beers, watch a football game. But it seems like with women, it's like, what, like you're a mom, you're a career woman, you know, like, how could you, like, what do you mean you're drinking, yeah. you know, like you're, you have a child here, you know, like to raise or you're, you have this job and you have your family and like, how could you, like, I used to have to go on lunch at my job and like have a few shots so I could finish the day at work without shaking. And so there was this thing, like everybody was like, look, you know, she's got the job. She's got the husband. They built the house. She's got the daughter. Well, a little did they know I was going home and drinking in the closet. I didn't have it all, you know, like, and I was afraid to say anything because of how it would look you know, and I just think that there's a lot of women out there probably, you know, like myself that are fearful of that, you know, that stigma and getting shamed and, uh, you know, not being able to get help because, you know, it just, it's just not as, I don't know, accepted, I think, as, you know, if, if a man's doing it, I'm not saying that people don't get upset with that either. And that's not right, but there just seems to be this stigma that, you know, we're supposed to like keep it together. And that's just my experience too, just with interacting with people, you know, in hospitals and in the public itself and, you know, healthcare, it just seemed like, you know, it was more frowned upon and I was more, you know, stigmatized and I've seen it on both ends. Like I have uncle that died at 50 from cirrhosis you know, and it was in the family and my mom did warn me, you know, uh, be careful, you know, but, you know, I just never thought, you know, I'm like, oh, yeah. I'm fine. You know, I made it to my thirties, you know, and then 
it all, you know, unfortunately, you know, so getting better, you know, cause obviously I did and I did get recovered. I am five years. There is, you know, a hope and good parts to this story. And, you know, I am now, and now I work for a company, a drug and alcohol company, and I help people get into rehabs or wherever they need, you know, so I'm the first person they talk to when they're reaching out for help. And so that's been great. And I can tell you from that experience, like a lot of the people without me even going into like actually saying I've been there, they will say to me like, oh, so you're in sobriety. And I'm like, yeah, like they can just like tell just from how I'm handling them in the call. Or sometimes there is an opportunity for me to share and be like, you know, no, I know I, I have been there, you know, and I really can say I understand and I'm not frustrated with them, you know, because I, I know there's very few people probably offering them that you know, empathy and kindness at that point, you know, because everybody's kind of had it. And, and I think that there should be a strong support group too, for the families, because, you know, everybody takes care of the addict or the, you know, or the alcoholic, and we get to go into this rehab, but like the families then are left standing there, like now, what about us? You know, we've had this path of destruction, you know, so that's why, you know, Al-Anon's good, or again, there's other groups for families where I really think that's important to go process yeah. what is going on. And again, peers to be like related to, but so, you know, I'm at this job that I'm doing now has been uh, very rewarding. I finally feel like I have found, you know, what I'm here to do. Um, my purpose, even at 50, <laughs> and this is what I will do, you know, for the rest of my life. Plus, I have my, you know, I started my own coaching business just because I feel like I want to give back and I have so much to give, you know, as far as, you know, advice and just being there with somebody. Sometimes it's just nice. You know, I had somebody, you know, it took a lot when I came out, you know, I had a therapist, I had group and I had a peer support person, you know, that I was meeting with and, you know, it goes a long way in, in helping you you know, stay in recovery and sober and you're accountable to, you know, to these people, but to yourself, you know, it's just so much better. You know, I don't even, you know, think about it anymore, you know, and that's not to say that, you know, there's people 20 years, you know, and they unfortunately can relapse, but right now, and I think part of it is giving back, you know, and coming up with other solutions, you know, and I had to come up with some of my own. So I know like coping mechanisms when I'm starting to feel, you know, because of course I still get anxious. There's still stress, you know, obviously yeah. I was looking at a one to five year prison term, which, you know, ended up being by the time all that came about, I had already went to the rehab on my own, you know, because I was sick of being, I, and I knew like, yeah. Hey, and I had resigned myself. If that's where I got to go, then fine. I deserve it almost, you know, like for what I did. And then, but by the time my case came up like a year and a half later, so I'm sober already that long, the judge said to me, you know, he's like, I don't often see this, you know, and you had a good lawyer, but you did the work. He goes, so I got a year probation, you know, and he's like, and I don't want to see you back here. And I'm like, oh, you won't. It was the one and only time in my whole life I ever got in trouble. I just did it all in one night. But I learned from it and now I'm trying to give back, you know, and maybe help somebody else not have to go through it as deep as I did maybe, or as painfully as I did. So that's kind of my mission is just to, you know, make it somewhat less stressful for somebody to go through that and to be there for them. Yeah. And you said a uh, couple of things that I think are very relatable. You know, I have a father who's an alcoholic and he, he still does, I guess, but especially when the family was together would hide the bottles in his boots on the neighbor's fence, you know, wherever to, you know, conceal it. And I've heard a lot of stories from other families with addicted family members who do the same, you know, they hide it or they, you know, a very popular tactic is getting those small, like airplane sized bottles and, Drinking those, like you said, on, on the way to work, driving somewhere or walking somewhere beforehand. And one of the reasons my father drank, which you mentioned, which I think is so relevant to a lot of people who drink, if not socially, for either A, to help them sleep or B, with anxiety, whether it's social anxiety or just 
you know, I know plenty of people, especially I've seen it more in women than men who, you know, get nervous going to, you know, whether it's a family function, a gathering of friends, and they say, you know, we'll just have a bit of alcohol to ease the nerves and then it makes them easier to talk to or that they have more fun. And the issue is it develops a mindset. And I saw this with my father where nothing was fun unless he had alcohol, right? So the movie theaters, he couldn't go unless he was drinking alcohol. The mall, wherever it was, it expanded to this point where it wasn't that the alcohol helped make it fun. It was that the alcohol did make it fun. And otherwise it wasn't. And one thing you mentioned that I think is so important, especially for people who are developing alcoholism, don't realize it. You talk about the progression and it's almost exponential where it starts off kind of flat. You don't really notice. And then, like you said, and some people would develop where you go from a stronger form of liquor to the next, or mm -hmm. if it's not a different type. And in most cases, you go from one bottle to two, from two to three, or, you know, from three shots to, to six, however many it is, you start drinking more and more. Same with drugs. And mm -hmm. what you said about rehab applies, I've seen it actually with drug addicts as well as alcoholics is that they go in and they come out and then they go straight back to using, you know, and people are, are confused. But to sum it up in, in a very popular phrase, you, you can't help someone who doesn't want to help themselves. And that's one of the most frustrating parts, like you said, as a family member, as someone who isn't going through it, you know, the the why, you know. And we've covered this a little bit in a previous episode with Dr. Brian, which you can find in the description below as well. We talked about how there's a difference between dry and sober. And what we talked about is what my father has done is people who stop drinking to heal their liver a little bit or to get functional again and then go back to drinking. And you mentioned doing that yourself, and that's very common. And it, sober is not drinking as well as, you know, working on the other aspects of your life to live without alcohol. But a lot of people are dry. They stop drinking, you know, to reset their liver, quote, reset, or heal up, like you said. And so I think it's very important for people to understand that distinct the the difference between that, especially family members who are dealing with an addicted loved one and are kind of confused, like, how could you go back to drinking after you stop drinking for X, Y, Z amount of time? You know, I've seen it with people who stop drinking for a couple of days, a few weeks. I've seen people who stop drinking for months or like you said, it could be 20 years later, you know, mm -hmm. and I love the way Dr. Brian discussed it. He said it, you know, alcoholism, that addiction is in the corner doing pushups, waiting to to take you down the minute your guard is down, you know, and we talked about how there was people at A and, and even my father who he doesn't, and you mentioned something important that AA isn't for everyone. You know, my father doesn't do well with AA because he hates hearing all the somber stories, the negative stories. He feels like it's a very negative it's a self-reflection and, and, you know, every AA group is different. So that might just be the one he goes to, but I think that's a great point to make. Like you said, there are other options now more, more than ever before with online groups and communities with other types of communities for helping addiction. And it's about finding the one that works for you. And in your case, and I think a lot of people would agree with you that peer who has been through it, that relatability, but yeah, like I said, it's ready to take you down. And my dad was talking about how he didn't understand how there was people in AA who were, you know, 70 and they've been sober for 20, 30, 40 years, why they were still there. But, you know, you have to always be fighting it. And so I want to ask you, Jen, for everyone out there who has gone through rehab or AA or, you know, sobered up mm -hmm. and you are still battling what is your life looking like with temptations battling? You mentioned earlier something super super true, which is it's everywhere. Compared to most addictions, you know, it's on the shelf, it's in the home, you go over to someone else's home, it's on the shelf, you go to a grocery store, right? I know mm -hmm. with like drugs, you know, not everyone has a stash of heroin in their kitchen on display, or you can't go to Kroger's <laughs> and there's bags, of, you know, right. so I, I totally understand that it is tempting. And I know a lot of alcoholics who, you know, they work on that. They work on being able to go to functions and, and be around it and not drink it. And it's funny, you know, I grew up in New Jersey and my dad's still there and he 
was talking about going to the wine fest on the beach. They had the wine tasting, just like you mentioned it in the beginning. And I was telling him, dad, you, you shouldn't go. And then, you know, he tries to justify, which I've seen a lot of alcoholics do is, well, it's only wine. It's not vodka or tequila. It's not, a, you know, it's just wine. I can have a sip of wine. And unfortunately, that can become a very slippery slope. So Jen, what is your battle looking like today? So today, my battle is looking like, and again, I'm five years in now, but so I have things I do every day. And as a matter of fact, I just did, I have a YouTube channel and I'm just in the middle of, or almost at the end of doing 21 healthy habits and sobriety, short videos I did. So for me, it looks like every morning, like I get up, I have to have at least like a half hour time to myself where I read some devotionals and just sit in the quiet and peace before my day starts and, and just, and pray. And then my day looks like, or sobriety looks like to me, if I'm, I have my healthy, you know, my habits, my coping mechanisms, I still go to therapy. Okay. I don't go twice a week anymore, but I go, you know, whatever works for me once a month, still keep that up. I believe in that. That's very healthy for me. A lot of moving my body. Okay. So before I started drinking, I was a runner and like, that was my high, my endorphin. So being outside for me and everybody has to find theirs, but for me, it's being outside, taking my border collie for a walk, being just with my border collie, you know, um, he's great animal therapy, but it's like getting enough sleep, eating properly, making sure I'm not, you know, getting angry or, or lonely or tired because these are like things where, like you said, that's when that it's going to creep in or I'm going to not be as like strong to be like, no, I, you know, I don't want that. You know, my head saying, just yeah. go to the store. You don't have to sit here anxious. Right. But if, but if I'm staying healthy or like, no, because a craving lasts about 12 minutes, they say. So I know get up and do something. I have an indoor bike. So in case it's not nice out, I can jump on that, you mm -hmm. know? So there are certain things in my life. I have to make sure I have downtime at night, you know, and get enough sleep and really take care of myself because it's like you said, and I said, it's always there. I saw it with my, you know, my own family members, my own, you know, that it, after 20 years, it comes back again, because you start to think you can do it again and you can't. And then I look at my life and think my daughter's back in my life. My parents are so happy. They didn't have to bury me, you know, like just that, like I, just yesterday, my mom's birthday's coming up. What do you want? She's like, I don't want anything. Just the fact that you're sober is like more than I could ever right. imagine, you know, or want, you know, so like the peace that gives everybody else, you know, and I, you know, it's like, I was like, it's like being a kid again, like rediscovering like what I used to like to do before I drank, you know, and taking care of myself because I, you know, that's the biggest thing I can say. And whatever that looks like for you, you know, maybe it looks differently. And that's what I work with people to find out, you know, like we start discovering things that they like to do before and, you know, that they can go to. And, you know, I don't feel guilty if I want to eat a half a thing of ice cream because I'm like, well, it's better than, <laughs> you know, a bottle of vodka, you know, like it used to be like you, you know, you said, but so that's what it looks like. And just staying busy and staying, I think part of the community, like I said, like now with this job and hearing, you know, like some of these people, I'm like, oh man, you know, like I remember being there in that desperation, you know what I mean? And I don't want that again. Like life is just so much better. You know, I used to lay in bed when I was drinking and it'd be summer and I just couldn't get out of bed because I was so sick and I'm hearing everybody outside life's going on, you know? And I just, I was, Oh, it makes me almost want to cry, you know, because mm. like I was stuck in, and that was like the worst part when I was stuck in that hole, you know, and I knew I had to get out. Like I wasn't denying it anymore, but I just didn't know how, you know, or, or who would help me, you know? And it, it was just, it was dark. But there, there is light, you know, and you can go on and things heal. Your body feels better. So, you know, and me telling my story and, and helping people to, like, I feel like I have this, you know, not responsibility, but almost, you I know, get what you're saying. to do that because I wish there would have been somebody like me sooner in my life, you know, that would have been more. And it's not to say that these other people in my life were bad. They just didn't get it. 
you know, and you're not going to get it, you know, unless you've been there, you don't. And like you said, I was at that point too, where I couldn't even make a phone call without having a drink or two, you know, like I couldn't even call somebody, you know, yeah, I, I, like your dad, like I couldn't, like it just was so a part of my life. Like I didn't have, but now I just surround myself, you know, with positivity. I'm big into aromatherapy. And some of this stuff even sounds dumb, but you know, it's not, it's like literally saving my life, you know, like, yeah, it's, it's like the simple things, but to get to figuring out what those are, yes, it is hard work, especially in the beginning, because it's always out there. And it, and again, like you said, it's everywhere, but it also is glamorized you know, it's okay to see somebody having a glass of wine at the restaurant, you know, and they're having fun. But if somebody was shooting up at the restaurant, you know, I mean, that would be a little more, you know, frowned upon, or you don't really see like the fun, glamorous side of doing drugs because, you know, there really isn't. Well, there's really not that fun of, and you just don't know if you're going to be that person. You know what I mean? And when you start, I tell people like, when this is another thing that I, try to tell people is a a helpful hint and sorry if I keep going on here, but like, if you're feeling like you're drinking uh, because of something, not just to have fun, like, you know, one, one or two drinks, because people can do that. But if you find that you're doing that to deal with something or cope with something, you know, that's the first warning sign, you know, that you you may want to try and because it's eventually going to become like it was for me. If that's why you're going to it, it's going to eventually progress, you know? And, you know, I said that next time, like a night out drinking, you know, served you the next morning, let me know, like actually write it down, like write down, like, okay, I had this many drinks last night. This is how I felt the next day. And the other night I didn't, I stayed home, watched a movie and I felt great the next morning. Like it's, it sounds simple, but like, if I would have known this early on enough, you know, I I might've been like, yeah, this is starting to look like I could be headed down the wrong road. I better knock it off, you know, but it just snuck right up on me, you know, I never wanted this to be, you know, who says they want to grow up being an alcoholic, you know? (laughs) Right, no. Born apart. I mean, nobody does. They don't. It just so, you yeah. know, you know. It's a great thing, you know. Once you're sober, and you can just, you know, clear headed because it takes a while for your brain too to, you know, like come oh, down yeah. all that and really get, you know, where you can. It can take six months to a year to even like all the signs they call it, you know, pause. And post acute withdrawal symptoms, you know, till you can really hone in on what does make you happy and making time for yourself, you know, and just saying no to things, you know, because I think a lot of us that do get into that are people pleasers and, you know, unfortunately don't really take time for ourselves. And then, you know, but that it is important. It's not selfish. <laughs> right. And now, Jen, for people who want, you know, to have you as an ally, where can we get in contact with you? Where can we find you? And what do you kind of focus on? So you can find me on YouTube. I'm just, you know, getting that channel up and going. So you can find me there to get to know me a little better. And also I have a website, Jen Ally Sober Coach, and that's where you can schedule a 15 minute. It's free, you know, talk with me, see if maybe we could work together. I have uh, social media, of course, you could reach out there. You can direct message me the call, the direct messaging, everything's confidential, of course. And my info is on my website, you know, phone number is there as well and email to reach out. However, you know, or if you are worried about somebody in your life and you want to like pass on my information for them to check me out, you know, nobody's going to know, you know, that they're looking. I know people are very, you know, secretive about some of this stuff in the beginning. Oh, yeah. it's- want to be, you know, so yes, they can find me there. Like I said, I'm just wrapping up a series of 21 healthy habits. And then I'm going to start another one, I think on books that I found. So yes, that's where you could find me. And, you know, I just, I work with you by pretty much being your ally, you know, being there for you, giving you, helping you figure out what healthy habits work for you. I could take, you know, like people as if they just come out of rehab And they want to like make sure they keep on, you know, like keep working on their mental health and their, and their sobriety. Great, you know, resource for that, because sometimes you're just like let out and you're like, okay, now what? And if they 
doesn't work for you, you know, a lot of people don't know that there is, there are people out there like me, sober coach, you know, who will work with you and talk with you and, you know, figure all this out and be your, you know, your inspiration, your cheerleader, your, you know, friend, you know, to get you through this a little easier than, than I had to go through it. So it's important. Or, you know, if you're just thinking about maybe you have a problem, you know, and you're not sure, I, I can help you with that too. You know, we can talk. So really at any juncture, if you're five years in and all of a sudden you're hitting like this problem in your life and you're worried, you know, that you might need some extra backup because you're entering into this traumatic thing or a big thing coming up and you're worried you might slip. I'm there for that too. <laughs> Awesome. Well, ladies and gentlemen, you can find those links in the description below. But Ms. Jen, thank you so much for coming to the show and sharing your story. And hopefully it resonates with someone. And again, ladies and gentlemen, just be looking out for one another. You never know. Like we said, it creeps up. Also, people are hiding it. So just take a closer look at people's behaviors and your own behavior and think about it. You know, so ladies and gentlemen, please look out for one another. But again, Ms. Jen, thank you so much for coming on the show. I appreciate you. Thank you. I appreciate you. Sailing through the ocean blue. Nuclear reactors, my crew. Got in the ship. The stars is our guide. Through the waves we ride. Jokes and laugh to fill the air. On this voyage, we have to share. Working together, side by side, as one family we will abide. In the heart of a ship, we decide. Nuclear operators with pride, powering the vessel with every stride. Our mission, a source of great pride.